Chilton Barnard, the president of the Supreme Court Historical Society. Please excuse my hoarseness. We have such warm weather here in Atlanta that my allergies have cropped up again, so I apologize for the report. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual lecture. Today, from Professor Helen Knowles on the subject of making minimum wage, Elsie Parish versus the West Coast Hotel Company. As I have said to some of you in the past, as I welcomed you to another uh, virtual lecture of the Society, the Society and its staff are working hard to adjust to a pandemic that just doesn't seem to want to go away. While we would love to be holding events in person, we hope you enjoy these virtual events which have their own virtues. They make accessible our lectures to a broad sweep of our members around the country, and the programs can be archived permanently on the Society's website. Today is the 10th virtual lecture that we have hosted in the year 2021. I hope that you have enjoyed those lectures as much as I have. Professor Knowles is going to talk for about 40 minutes. Then she will pause and will take questions and comments. If you have such questions, please submit them via the Q&A function of your Zoom connection. Jim Duff, the Society's Executive Director, will be reviewing and selecting topics to share with the professor. Now, a bit more detail about our speaker today. Helen Knowles is an Associate Professor of History at Oswego State University of New York. She received her PhD from Boston University. She is the author of The Tie Goes to Freedom, Justice Anthony M. Kennedy on the Liberty. She is also the author of the recently published um, Making Minimum Wage, which inspired today's talk. She won the Society's Hughes Gossip Award uh, for the best student article on Supreme Court history in 2006. She recently agreed to join the board of the editors uh, of the Society for the Journal of Supreme Court History. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Helen Knowles to the Society's virtual platform. Professor, you're on. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. And uh, a very sincere thank you to the Supreme Court Historical Society for this opportunity to talk about my book. It is indeed an honor. Let me go ahead and share that screen. which I'm currently unable to share the screen. You should be able to now. Uh, yes, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for your help. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. It really is uh, a, a wonderful a privilege to talk to you today about my book. And um, I really want to say a, a, an immense thank you to the Supreme Court Historical Society, not only for this opportunity, but also uh, for the work that the Society is doing to carry on these virtual lectures during the pandemic. It's really a, an immense service to the community that the Society is doing. Now, uh, before I talk about some aspects of the book, some important thank yous uh, beyond thanking the society. I am 
deeply indebted to the research assistance of a large number of staffs of, of archives and libraries across the country. There's no doubt that I simply would not have been able to write this book without their help. However, I think perhaps more importantly, I wouldn't have been able to write this book without the generosity shown to me by several of Elsie Parrish's descendants. And I'm gonna spend the, a great amount of time talking about Elsie and her lawyer today. And without the help of, of Elsie's family members and without the help of the grandchildren of the two principal lawyers involved in West Coast Hotel versus Parish, this book simply would not have happened. Indeed, the exquisite work of, um, I don't know whether what you call it crochet or sewing work that I have behind me is something to which that indebtedness extends because that is a work that Elsie Parrish made many decades ago and which her great granddaughter gave to me. I'm gonna be talking more about her great granddaughter later on, but I understand that Deb Parrish Stewart is joining us today uh, virtually from somewhere across the country. So um, I extend a, a, a warm welcome to her and, and a sort of public thank you to her for her help. And so it is now to her great grandmother's story, to Elsie's story that we now turn. <laughs> For our purposes today, I want to begin my telling of that story in December 1936, almost exactly 85 years ago. On December 17th, 1936, it was unseasonably warm outside as Elsie Parrish went about her work as a chambermaid at the Jim Hill Hotel in OMAC in Washington State. Temperatures were in the 40s, which I have to say is about 15 degrees warmer than it currently here is here in upstate New York. And the winter sunshine based um, OMAC, which is a small town in the north central region of Washington State, about 45 miles south of the Canadian border. Elsie and her husband Ernie had moved to OMAC Popular, about a population of 2,500 in 1936. For Elsie, relocating had seen her return to life as a chambermaid, employment she hadn't been able to find since leaving the services of the Cascadian Hotel in the much larger city of Wenatchee, about 100 miles south of Omak. Elsie worked at the Cascadian, one of the largest employers in town, from late summer 1933 through until May 11th, 1935. And not only, uh, you know, I'd like to point out that not only was the Cascadian one of the largest employers in town, but a fun fact about the Cascadian Hotel is that when it was built in 1929, it was at the time the tallest building in Wenatchee. That is still the case. The Cascadian Hotel, although it hasn't been a hotel since the 1970s, remains the tallest building in town. But let's go back to 1935, 1936. During the Great Depression, any wages were obviously better than no wages. However, the amount that Elsie was receiving as a chambermaid violated the state law because in 1913, Washington state had enacted a minimum wage law for women. And under the terms of that law, Elsie should have been receiving considerably more money in her weekly pay packet than she was. So when the, the Cascadian Hotel discharged Elsie, they presented her with a check for $17 which was the balance of the wages she was owed. But upon the instructions of her lawyer, she refused to accept the money. This is because Elsie knew that under state law, her family was owed far more than $17. To be precise, she was owed $216.19 
which as you can imagine was an absolute fortune for a family during the depression. Now, life living in Wenatchee became quite a lot more difficult for Elsie and her husband. Uh, that Ernie was her second husband, she married in 1934. Life became more difficult when they decided to sue the Cascadian Hotel. And so the couple walked into the third floor office of C.B. Connor, who was a local lawyer, and asked for his assistance in suing the Cascadian. One of the city's most respected lawyers, Connor took the parish's case pro bono and initiated the lawsuit that we now know as West Coast Hotel versus Parish on June 10th, 1935. Now, 2,600 miles away and an entire world away from OMAC, Washington, on the very same day, on December 17th, 1936, it also felt like winter had not yet come to the nation's capital. Attorney General Homer S. Cummings sat in his office and continued to ruminate over the con contents of a letter sent to him the previous day by his friend and confidant, Princeton professor Edward S. Corwin. Outside, the rain had begun to dissipate, leaving the skies over the nation's capital partly cloudy, with temperatures in the 40s, just like they were on the other side of the country. However, in the weeks leading up to Christmas that year, almost 85 years ago, the nation's liberal intelligentsia felt nothing but cold winds blowing. They held out little hope that progressive change would come from within the walls of the US Supreme Court because they believed that there was a conservative majority that was obstructing the New Deal agenda at every turn. And the letter that Corwin wrote expressed that pessimism. It is probably utopian, he wrote, to hope that the court will supply the needed remedy for a situation which it has itself created. Now, Corwin and Cummings were of one mind. A solution to the court's uh, progress inhibiting rulings would have to come in the form of action from the other branches of the federal government. As I am sure many of you are aware, history remembers Corwin's letter for one of its suggestions, because that suggestion became FDR's plan to pack the court with justices more sympathetic to his agenda. That plan was not unveiled to the public until February 1937. Two months earlier, on December 17th, which is where we started our story today, neither Corwin, nor Cummins, nor the president for that matter, could have known that unfolding before the existing justices was the latest chapter in a story that would fundamentally change the narrative of the attempt to pack the court, ultimately rendering FDR's plan redundant. For December 17th was the second and concluding day of oral arguments in West Coast Hotel versus Ernest and Elsie Parish. Fun fact, it came exactly 22 years after the court first heard oral arguments in a case involving the constitutionality of a minimum wage law for women. And it was a case whose decision on March 29th, 1937, would quote unquote supply the needed remedy that Corwin had once considered it utopian to hope for. The US Supreme Court's 1937 decision in that case, West Coast Hotel versus Parish, upholding the Washington State minimum wages for women law and handing Elsie a victory has been the subject of an immense scholarly outpouring, as I'm sure many people are aware. This is in large part because almost immediately the ruling was labeled the switch in time that saved nine. Implicit in that label was a belief that 
when the justices were confronted with FDR's threat to pack the court, that uh, Justice, Justice Owen Roberts in particular reversed course and voted with his more liberal colleagues to uphold a law that was very similar to the New York minimum wage law that a majority, including Roberts, had ruled unconstitutional the previous summer. Hence the, the idea that there was this switch. The overwhelming majority of literature about parish continues to focus on that relationship, even though historians have long since shown that the justices decided what their votes would be in the parish case before FDR's announcement of the plan. However, this doesn't stop people from mentioning West Coast Hotel versus Parish and the court packing plan in the same sentence. In my book, I discuss the relevant case law and I lead the reader through the legal intricacies of the parish litigation. But what I try to do is also to bring to light the human stories that were obscured by the case's connection to FDR and his court packing plan, especially the story of the woman whose hard work started everything. Elsie was born in Kansas in 1899, the 10th and last child of Edward and Emma Murray. Alas, uh, a, a family photo of all of the children and the parents has not survived, but what you see here is Edward and Emma with three of Elsie's older siblings. So she was born in 1899. Sometime in 1914, and somewhere between Kansas and Montana, Elsie married Roy Lee. I haven't been able to find out exactly where they married, but we do know that sometime in 1914, between Kansas and Montana, the couple married. In March the following year, five days shy of her 16th birthday, Elsie gave birth to the first of the couple's seven children. Living on a homestead in Coffee Creek, close to the Murray homestead that you see pictured here or um, what's left of uh, the Murray homestead in Coffee Creek, Montana, Elsie faced a tough life. She juggled the demands of being a frontier mother, and I talk about that a lot in the book. She was also the wife to an alcoholic spouse, and a daughter-in-law, the last I think being kind of important for understanding the pressure she faced because for the entirety of their married life, Roy and Elsie lived with Roy's parents. Elsie later divorced Roy when she moved to Washington State in the early 1930s. So that's a little bit of an introduction about Elsie. But I also mentioned earlier that when Elsie was dismissed by the Cascadian Hotel, she sought out the legal services of C.B. Connor, who was a lawyer in Wenatchee, who at the time was working out of the Deneen building in Wenatchee, which literally, if you walk out of the front door of the Deneen building and turn right, there, uh, just a block and a half up the street, is the Cascadian Hotel. Now, before I tell you about Connor and the immense role he played in securing Elsie a victory in her lawsuit, I should acknowledge his granddaughter, Christine, who may well be joining us virtually today, who very generously gave me exclusive access to her grandfather's unpublished memoir. That memoir's chapter about the parish case gave me more knowledge about the litigation than I simply uh, could not have found anywhere else. And there are some real wonderful nuggets of information about the case that I've drawn from that memoir that can be found in the book. Connor was well aware that the law of the land was not in 
in favor for his new client. However, what his memoir and the briefs in Parish demonstrate are that he had a strong, passionate and unwavering belief that the law totally disregarded the human impact of paying workers very minimal as opposed to minimum wages. In the depths of the depression, the Cascadian Hotel basically held all of the employment bargaining power with its employees. As Connor remarked in his memoir, the 1913 Washington law was written to take care of situations just like this. These laborers evidently needed the work or they would not have been there. And the fact that they accepted a smaller sum than the statutory price was due not to their agreement to take that sum, but to the necessity which drove them to the work and the fear and knowledge that in case they raised a question about it, they would lose their jobs. One of the, the most valuable things that Connor's memoir tells us is that it was because Elsie raised such a question that she lost her job at the Cascadian. Uh, it's my, uh, my understanding that it's literally the only source that confirms for us why Elsie was fired by the hotel. So a little bit more about C.B. Connor. He was born in 1876 in Linden, which to this day, is a very small rural village just west of the Appalachian Trail, straddling the line between two different counties in Virginia, approximately 65 miles west of Washington, DC. As you can see from these photos, the main thoroughfare in Linden is called the John Marshall Highway, which I have to, to think is terribly appropriate ultimately given that Connor's biggest case was one that ended up at the US Supreme Court. Growing up, CB and his siblings would undoubtedly have been told stories about the Civil War Battle of Manassas Gap. They would have had easy access to the battleground a mere half a mile from their house, upon which the battle was fought on July 23rd, 1863 at the end of the Gettysburg campaign. Why do I mention this? Well, for the simple reason that CB had a respect for his heritage that was just one part of his abiding cradle to grave love of history and country. He read and wrote extensively about those subjects. Now, it was after a visit to the Pacific Northwest in 1912 that CB decided to relocate his wife and children from Oklahoma, which is where he was practicing law, to Wenatchee, which is what he would call home for the rest of his life. And so we turn back now from Connor's um, upbringing and a little bit of a sort of biographical sketch back to West Coast Hotel versus Parish. Undeterred by the Chelan County Superior Court ruling in favor of the West Coast Hotel Company, and that was the first level of litigation in the case. And I should note that the West Coast Hotel Company is the name on the case because they operated the Cascadian Hotel. Undeterred by losing at the first level, Connor files an appeal with the Washington State Supreme Court. When he asked the state attorney general to file an amicus brief, he received the following reply, quote, the attorney general thinks we could not present and file a brief in the case that would add anything to yours, end quote. Um, in part, that was just a polite pro forma response, but there was also a lot of substantive truth to the attorney general's praise for Connor's brief. Connor considered this paragraph from the Washington State Supreme Court brief 
the most important page that I have ever written or shall ever write in my life. And he tells us in his memoir that it was crafted at the behest of one of his Wenatchee colleagues who suggested that he put more of himself into the brief, and he certainly did. Because what you see here is a very compelling argument that he is making, that he's saying that this law is really needed to, uh, to help female workers. He's making a compelling argument that the public did indeed have an interest in seeing that female workers were not exploited. But there was one problem. This was a compelling social argument. The legal standard at the time for regulating businesses, regulating using, for example, a minimum wage law, meant that businesses uh, that the public had an interest in, um, in terms of being able to regulate those businesses, that standard was quite different from the compelling social argument that Connor is laying out here, because at the time a hotel was not considered a business that was affected by a public interest. So maybe you're sitting there and saying, well, surely that makes Connor's briefs and his arguments highly problematic. Well, I would argue that, that simply isn't the case. And I would argue that it's here that Connor's fundamentally important role in winning Elsie's case became apparent. Connor refused to believe that a 1923 US Supreme Court precedent that struck down a minimum wage law for women in the District of Columbia placed a major legal obstacle in the his client. He just refused to believe that. Similarly, he refused to believe that the court could not declare hotels to be a business affected by a public interest simply because it hadn't done that in the past. As I explain in detail in the book, Connor recognized that there were other precedents of immense importance that made compelling legal arguments in support of his client's case precedents that were even more compelling in light of the social need for minimum wage laws for women that you see him outline here. Connor made those arguments successfully, it should be noted, at both the state Supreme Court and US Supreme Court levels. Before I tell you what Elsie's life was like after the Supreme Court decided the case in her favor and what Connor did after the parish decision, a few words about the immediate impact of that decision for similarly situated workers in Seattle. So the banner headline emblazoned across the front page of the December 27th, 1936 issue of the Sunday News, which was a pro New Deal labor newspaper published in Seattle, predicted that for labor, 1937 is our year. In terms of minimum wage laws for women, that was a very astute prediction. In Seattle, the legal complaints about failure to comply with the 1913 minimum wage law in Washington state flooded into the office of the King County Superior Court almost as soon as the ink was dry on the US Supreme Court's decision in Parrish. Various newspapers reported that floods of minimum wage lawsuits filed after Parrish numbered into the hundreds in Seattle. And articles sometimes featured pictures of women plaintiffs, as you see here. Many of those records have not survived the ravages of time. And it is undoubtedly possible that the newspaper reports exaggerated the number of filings. However, I was able to find the filings for 65 civil cases filed by female plaintiffs seeking back pay 
in Seattle. Now, unfortunately, many of those women did not get the back wages they sought uh, for lots of different legal procedural reasons. But despite that fact, it is clear that they all benefited directly and indirectly from Elsie Parrish's decision to sue her former employer. A decision which, of course, would not have been possible without the help of C.B. Connor. In his memoir, Elsie's lawyer brought the chapter about Parrish to a close with the following paragraph, which I think is worth showing you in its entirety. And what did I get for these hours of labor? Asks Connor. I should be very much disappointed if my son should be called upon to perform some heavy task for the welfare of his community and having done it, well, sit down and consider the amount of his compensation in dollars and cents, overlooking the results of his work. I should want him to be satisfied in the knowledge that his labors had brought comfort to some needy person, that he had rendered a real community service that is how I should want him to consider his work. And I would be false to myself, did I think of compensation from this case as it is measured by money. Working women are receiving better wages, children have more food and better clothes. May I not have a reason to hope that I have served my country and in this thought receive a very handsome remuneration indeed? This passage captures all of the reasons why Connor considered it important to take CB, to take Elsie's case, excuse me. Alas, CB would not live to see his adult children accomplish many great things in their own right. In the spring of 1941, he and Irene departed Wenatchee for a long planned car trip that would take them through 21 states as they made their way to the Shenandoah Valley to visit their families. Now, CB, as a practicing lawyer, could not afford to spend a protracted amount of time away from his work, so he completed the 8,000-mile round trip on his own, driving back to the Pacific Northwest while his wife, Irene, stayed on with her family in Virginia. But her vacation was cut short when word arrived of CB's death. On May 21st, 1941, on, while on business at a hotel in Seattle, CB suffered a sudden and fatal heart attack. I think the important point about his passing is that indicative of the way in which the stories of the people closest to West Coast Hotel versus Parish quickly faded from people's memories is the fact that references to that landmark decision. The biggest case CB ever litigated were conspicuous by their complete absence from the obituaries that were published in the Wenatchee Daily World, the main newspaper in Wenatchee. But what about Elsie's life? after West Coast Hotel versus Parish. In 1938, Elsie headed east for a family reunion at the Murray Homestead in Coffee Creek. We know little about the next few years of her and Ernie's lives. Uh, pretty much there's a, there's a large gap uh, that I was unable to fill. Uh, uh, used censuses and things like that to, to give me an idea of where she lived between 1938, you see her pictured here, she's on the far left of the photograph she's pictured with some of her sisters. Um, after that family reunion, however, the trail pretty much goes cold until the early 1950s, because what we do know is that in 1951, Ernie and Elsie moved to Anaheim, California literally about half a mile down the street from where Disneyland 
would open four years later. Um, what you see here is a, a photograph from that area of Anaheim, an aerial photograph of Disneyland being constructed. Ernie and Elsie would live out the rest of their lives in Anaheim in close proximity to other family members. And this has to be one of my favorite photographs of that family that Elsie's great granddaughter shared with me. You see Elsie second from left and then Ernie all the way over on the right. Los Angeles became Elsie's adopted home. She and Ernie rarely traveled beyond the confines of their neighborhood. And fun fact, she became an avid LA Dodgers fan after that franchise relocated from Brooklyn in 1958. Watching on KTTV Channel 11 or listening to the legendary Vin Scully broadcast the games on the radio was, as her great granddaughter tells me, just about the only time that Elsie swore. The great granddaughter, Deb, you see pictured here as a teenager, lived with Elsie and Ernie on and off for over a decade until Elsie's death. Elsie was like a mother to Deb and Deb misses her all the time. She fondly recalls the dress that grandma bought her for the junior high graduation the enticing smell of freshly baked biscuits dripping with butter and honey, the first job at Carl's Jr. that Elsie got her, all the clothes that Elsie made for Deb's dolls. And I think uh, the, the funniest thing is she also remembers that Elsie was an avid gardener and that Elsie would take Deb to a local nursery and surreptitiously put clippings of plants into her purse, saying that this was ultimately very good for the shrubs. Elsie raised the teenage Deb at a time that she focused on many pleasures of her retirement because Ernie brought home a regular income working at Knott's Berry Farm, which I should point out is also where Deb got her pet turtle and rabbits. But did Elsie ever talk much to her friends and family about the role she played in a landmark US Supreme Court case? The answer to that question is a resounding no. Deb, who I had the opportunity to meet and interview in Wenatchee, only found out about the case when she was a teenager. Her reaction, it was like, whoa, cool. Elsie's five minutes of legal fame were a mere footnote in the family's history. I've known about this for years, says Deb, but nobody ever paid much attention to it. Indeed, Barbara Roberts, the former governor of Oregon, and indeed the first female governor of Oregon, herself a trailblazer for women's rights and equality, only found out about her famous great aunt, Elsie, when I contacted her in 2017. On Monday, March 31st, 1980, Elsie and Ernie received the joyous news that Karen, who was the wife of Deb's brother, Dwayne, had gone into labor and baby Ryan was born that evening. It was a welcomed addition to a family that was still grieving from the untimely death six weeks earlier of Elsie and Roy's daughter, Gladys. The family's happiness was short lived though, because sometime in the early morning of Thursday, April 3rd, 1980, Elsie Parrish died peacefully in her sleep. Ernie survived her by nine years and was buried next to her in the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Long Beach. And so in conclusion, in 1988, Margie Jones, a Wenatchee native and local historian, observed that during the previous year, 1987, the 50th anniversary of the parish decision 
pass virtually without recognition. Most of the people, including Elsie, are dead, she wrote. They died without being given the honors they deserved. All of us are better off because a tired chambermaid wanted to be paid what was her rightful salary under the law. From now on, when I look at the Cascadian, continued Jones, I will remember Elsie Parrish and offer up a silent thank you. Forever, she will be a part of our history, but hopefully she will not be a lost part of it. The decision in West Coast Hotel versus Parish, the decision which bears Elsie's name, continues to be of importance 85 years later for many reasons. The stories behind that decision will always be of importance, reminding us that the law can profoundly affect the lives of not just the parties to a case, but millions of other individuals. In so doing, it reminds us of a fundamental truth related to the law of this particular case. In March 1936, Eleanor Morehouse Herrick, the regional director of the National Labor Relations Board, gave a radio address entitled Women's Constitutional Right to Starve. And she gave that address on the New York City radio station WEAF. Ultimately, she observed, minimum wage laws are not an academic question or even a legal one, but instead a human problem. It is for that reason that I share Margie Jones's belief that Elsie's story deserved to be told. It is a human story about changing the law to help women who were entitled at the very least to make minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Knowles. Uh, it was a fascinating and humanizing uh, look at Elsie Parrish. And we're going to be taking uh, uh, questions from the audience now. If you have questions, please, uh, type them into the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many of those as we, as we can. Um, I would kick it off with, uh, I mean, it was just a wonderfully humanizing look that you gave us uh, of Elsie and, and her family. And I do hope that uh, some of her family members have joined us today. Uh, we certainly would welcome them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about Justice Roberts' um, uh, switch uh, in, in his vote? Uh, elaborate a little bit uh, about that and perhaps maybe his explanation for it if, if uh, one was given in later years, um, if, uh, if not the, uh, in the opinion itself. Sure. Um, so, I think that the best way to sort of start by answering that question is uh, to go back to really where I started the talk, December 16th. So December 16th, 17th, 1936, the US Supreme Court hears the oral arguments in the Parish case. And then the justices meet, I think, two days later on December 19th and cast their votes in the case. Now, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, and as I think probably many people know, the, the case itself, the decision was not announced until March, the end of March, 1937. And in the intervening time, uh, FDR had announced his court packing plan. That does not mean, however, that uh, the justices had no idea uh, sort of, they weren't swayed by the court packing plan because when they met on the 19th, um, Justice Stone was still hospitalized with dysentery at the time. Uh, and so the, the, the vote was 4-4 in his absence, but everybody knew that he would be one of the votes to uphold the Washington law. 
And obviously one of those five votes became just Justice Roberts. He uh, switched his vote from uh, the uh, Topaldo case the previous year, decided at the beginning of June, 1936, which struck down a similar New York minimum wage law. Emphasis on similar. There were um, some sort of intricate legal differences between the New York law at issue in the Topaldo case and the Washington law at issue in the Parish case. Um, intricate, when I say intricate, very intricate differences that I get into more in the book too much to, to want to go into into detail now. Um, that's one of the one of the reasons you can sort of try to explain Roberts's switch. Um, a number of different scholars have offered differing explanations as to why Roberts switched. Uh, I would kind of want to leave it to those scholars to sort of figure out between themselves who has the more convincing argument. I think from my perspective, as somebody, I, yes, I have a PhD in political science, but I'm more of a legal historian. I think I put more stock in the argument that there were important differences between the New York law and uh, the Washington law, but nevertheless, keeping in mind that the justices, even if FDR's court packing plan had not yet been announced when they, when they made their vote, they were nevertheless cognizant of uh, the impact of the depression, that the, the plight of people during the depression and how badly the Topaldo case had been received. You know, it's very interesting uh, today, um, the timing of, of your lecture, and it's been great. Um, it's timed perfectly to the release of the President's Commission's report on court on the Supreme Court, which includes uh, commentary on court packing proposals, even to this day. So uh, it's, it's a well timed <laughs> lecture today. And we're, we're grateful. We're getting questions from the audience and I will share uh, and, and pass those on. Um, one is, uh, did Francis Perkins ever speak specifically on the Elsie Parrish case? Wow. <laughs> that is an incredibly good question to which I do. I, I'm going, to, I'm going to, to confess, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I haven't found anything specific. I've read a couple of, of uh, books about her. I don't recall her mentioning anything. That being said, I made extensive use of um, uh, archives at uh, the Labor Library at Cornell University, where there's a lot of material from her and, and, and other leaders. I don't recall anything specific that she said, but I certainly wouldn't take that as meaning that she didn't say anything specific about the parish case. That's a fascinating question. Um, another uh, from the audience is, although the court packing plan had not been announced when the justices voted, wasn't there DC uh, talk of the idea in the air at that time? I think you uh, touched on that a little bit. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, the issue was uh, circulating or in, in, in the um, uh, political discourse. Uh, absolutely right that it was circulating in the political discourse. However, it's my understanding from the literature about the court packing plan that it was kept, the, the, the president and his advisors like Cummings kept the idea very close uh, within house just uh, shared it with a very few number of advisors and that if it if details did start to leak out I think in terms of the timeline that almost certainly happened after the justices had taken their December 19th vote in the case. Mm -hmm. um, 
How did you come to work on this project? Wow. Um, if you had said to me 12 years ago that I would end up writing a book about the stories behind West Coast Hotel versus Parish, I'd have probably laughed you out of the room. So uh, just to dismiss that. Uh, at the time I, so this is 2010, I was working as a visiting professor of politics at Whitman College in Walla Walla in Washington State. And what I do in my civil liberties classes is generally have students look into the history and the stories of the cases that they're reading about. And so I assigned a, a, an assignment for the students to, to do just that. And a couple of the students wrote me papers about uh, some of the stories, what they could find about the parish case. And two things emerged. Firstly, that they couldn't find very much. And secondly, and I, I think I was maybe aware of this at the time, but certainly after the students had submitted their papers, I realized that West Coast Hotel versus Parish had taken place about 140 miles from Whitman College. And that started me thinking, perfect opportunity while I was living out there to, to go and do some primary research that wouldn't be very time consuming in terms of travel or financially taxing. And so I, I went to Wenatchee to the library and started looking through old newspapers. At that time, the, there was one microfilm machine in the basement tucked away where you literally had to, to feed, 20, uh, feed quarters into the machine to print out stuff. I started to get that and then I put out a couple of um, requests on listservs and uh, several family members of the lawyers reached out to me and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, we're certainly glad you, you pursued it. Um, another, we have time for one uh, other question here, um, and I'll, uh, I'll pass this on. Understanding the human dimension behind the cases uh, that they read really helps law students who will be future judges and advocates better understand the magnitude of the impact laws like minimum wage laws had on women and families. Your book makes it possible to share this with law students. What other ways can we better integrate the role of women in making constitutional law into both undergraduate teaching and the law school curriculum? Wow, another wonderful question. And a good observation about the power of your book. Thank you. Um, I would say that what any educator who's teaching this material should do is to bring that material in any way they can, bring, bring it to life. Um, yeah, particularly at the moment, uh, any of us who are teaching, we know our students are facing unprecedented challenges and it can often be difficult to sort of balance all of those challenges and soak up uh, the material that they need to uh, just from reading texts. Um, and so I try to make, uh, try to make this material, and this would be my recommendation, make it very much of a, a visual experience for students. Show them the, the photographs of these women involved tell them about these these student these women's lives because that then connects these women to these students in a way that just reading about them on a page might not otherwise do so whatever tools one can find at one's disposal pi pictures of these women uh, in various different situations and then if we're talking more contemporary uh, interviews with uh, prominent female lawyers, that, that's a really good way to, to get students exposed to these stories. 
Well, that's a great advice. And you certainly did that brilliantly today. I think your presentation and the the, the visuals that accompanied it were uh, very uh, illuminating and powerful. And uh, it, it triggered so many thoughts in, in my own mind. And, you know, just thinking back to my family history and the role, the very important role all the women played uh, throughout it. Uh, well done, as, as usual. We're just delighted that you um, have done this for us today, Professor Knowles, and that you're going to help us here more at the Historical Society and get more um, actively involved with us here. Uh, so we're, we're grateful for that. I want to hold up a copy of your book again. So uh, everyone uh, who, who's uh, attending um, can visualize it. It's available, signed copies are available from our Historical Society's gift shop at www.supremecourthistory.org. And uh, we hope you will uh, read the book. It's a great read, as you might uh, uh, anticipate from today's lecture. Our society's programs are going to resume in January 2022 with two uh, more virtual programs. Uh, as uh, Chilton Varner uh, indicated at the outset, we're having great success uh, with these visual programs, pandemic or not, and we're going to continue them after the pandemic uh, lifts. Uh, they've been uh, well, very well received. We're going to launch a series on uh, civics and American democracy. And Suzanne Spaulding is going to kick that off for us, speaking on reinvigorating civics as a national security imperative. Uh, she's going to do that on uh, January 11th at 7 p.m. On January 31st at noon, Professor Christopher Brooks will be speaking on John Stuart Rock, the first African-American to become a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Registration for both events is open and available at the, on the Society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org. Uh, and now a brief reminder that a survey will go out later this evening to uh, everyone who registered in advance. Uh, please do respond to it. We wanna make these programs as rich and accessible as possible. And we take your comments Seriously, and thanks to all who joined us today and participated uh, not only by watching, but uh, sending us questions for, for Professor Knowles. Uh, this was a great one. And uh, thank you, Professor Knowles, for joining us and for all of you who joined us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.